Well, good morning, good morning, and uh, welcome to today. Welcome to our webinar. Um, we are very thankful to you for being here uh, with us to learn about important issues that's affecting our world and our business. And uh, I just, just a quick brief, want to thank our wonderful NAR staff um, to whom Ty and I are eternally grateful for all of their good work, their dedication, their kindness to us when we ask them too many questions. And so far they haven't got too annoyed with us. Um, and of course, I want to thank my co-chair, Tai Hong Nguyen, I hope I got that right, Tai, I keep practicing it, um, who is going to be your chair this uh, coming year for the Global Business and Alliance Committee. He's superb. If you don't know him, you should get to know him. Um, Tai's great. I'm, I have very much enjoyed being with him this, this past year, two years, and um, you're, you'll be in really good hands with Tai. Um, just before we get into today's topic, uh, just a couple of housekeeping items I wanted to bring to your attention. Um, if you haven't yet registered for the annual conference and expo, could you please do that soon? If not, not right now, but after the webinar would be great. Um, and then the website is www.conference.realtor. So it's conference.realtor. Um, and I know the conference is being held virtually this year, and I think we're all a bit bummed about that. And um, we miss all of our people. We miss seeing everybody. Um, but we're still going to be holding some great events um, that you all have become very accustomed to over the years. Of course, they're going to be a little bit different, but there's going to be over 100 sessions. And they're going to be very focused on uh, the trends that are affecting our industry and the current uh, uh, climate that we're working in. So uh, going to be some good new ideas and um, tactics in order to handle our business uh, as it is changing. Uh, we'll be holding, I'm very excited about this, again, we prefer it in person, but here we are. Um, we're going to be holding all of our global events, including our COVID adaption of the International Night Out, where we'll be announcing and honouring the very best of our global volunteer corps. So, corps. so um, Again, a little bit different, but we really would appreciate your participation and enjoy the event virtually all together. Um, and of course, we know the networking isn't the same virtually, but we are excited to announce that we will also be hosting a virtual networking session during the conference and maybe multiple sessions um, throughout the conference just to keep everybody apprised of what's going on, keep everybody content, keep everybody connected. That's, that's the whole purpose. So the conference is going to last from uh, November 2nd through the 18th um, and I won't take up all of our time today because we've got some great presenters, we've got some really good information to come our way and um, so please go to the website um, to check out the specific times of everything. Again that's conference.realtor. Um, okay so now let's get down to business. Um, we will be continuing today to discuss the hot topic um, that, is, that this committee uh, has been focusing on for this past two years. It's the US visa and immigration policy and it, its impact to the US real estate industry. All of us on the committee and those of us that work in this space understand the importance of a consistent and attainable US immigration policy and the effect that it has on foreign investment into the United States residential and commercial real estate investment. Uh, last year, as the vice chair of the committee, I'm proud to tell you that we were able to review and revise NAR's policy on the H-2B visa. Um, and, that's, uh, and we've worked to ensure that the US employers could utilize these workers to help their businesses grow. So we're continuing to work on that by highlighting the ways that the US benefits from these visa programs and what will happen to the US economy if the programs become difficult to attain. So today we'll be getting a 360 degree view from experts across many industries of how the US real estate is and what it will be and how it will be impacted when these policies are changed. So I'm going to jump into our first speaker, Lisa Calarco. Um, for those of you who don't know Lisa, you need to get to know Lisa. She's amazing, wonderful. Um, Lisa Calarco is the manager of the Global Program and Outreach for NAR's engagement team. In this role, her primary focus is helping the state and local associations around the United States establish and grow global councils to support members' global business development and the larger communities that they serve. Lisa has been with NAR in various roles for 14 years and has spent the last seven blissful 
years with us here in Global, um, within the global space and doing, I think, her best and most passionate work that I've ever seen her do in her life this year with us. So I'm going to pass you over to Lisa and she's going to um, give you some amazing information. Thank you, Claire. I don't quite know how to thank you for that, but thank you. And you're right. I have been spending seven blissful years in um, working with Global in this particular um, part has really, you guys have done such a great job raising the issues and, and challenging all of us to think them through properly. So thank you for your leadership on that as well and your committee members as well. So um, Claire set the stage. What, what I'm going to do is kind of set the table for our amazing experts who are going to be speaking after me more specifically on these topics. So I am going to get into it. We like I like to start every presentation by defining what who we're talking about. When we talk about global clients, I know um, most people understand it at this point, but it bears repeating. When we talk about global clients, we're talking about foreign buyers living abroad, immigrants, first generation Americans, Americans buying abroad, clients with international connections, and investment buyers. We do an annual report. Our NAR research team is amazing. And every year we do a, a large report that looks at the international investment by foreign buyers into the United States, 43 pages long. Feel free to download that and digest it. All I'm going to tell you about today is that it's last year from March 2019 to March 2020. We saw that we were reporting in $74 billion in residential real estate was purchased by foreign buyers. That equated to roughly 154,000 properties across the United States. And 61% of those buyers were resident foreign buyers. Why does that matter? Well, resident foreign buyers are very specific to what we're talking about today. They are non-US citizens who are recent immigrants, less than two years at the time of the transaction, or non-immigrant visa holders, ding, 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 who reside for more than six months in the United States for professional, educational, or other reasons. So 61% of that $74 billion was purchased by this category of buyers in the last year. We also look at the commercial side of the transactions and our 2020 commercial report showed that 53.4 billion came in in cross-border capital inflows last year. Um, 4.3 billion of that was noted to be sold by NAR members specifically. 58% was all cash, and 54% of those buyers lived abroad. So, inversely, 46% of those buyers were resident buyers. Okay, and this is all just letting you know what's going on. But in part of that research that we looked at our commercial members, we asked them um, the challenges that they have with working with an international client. And as you can see here, Highlighted at the top was immigration status, getting visas approved through government programs was one of their main challenges, as was the EB-5 investor amount increase, which increased last year from 500,000 to 900,000. So we started to hear some alarm bells going off and with the work of the GBA committee last year on the H-2B visa, we knew that visas were starting to start to impact our um, members, but we still need to find a little bit more how. So before we talk about the how, let's discuss what are you what the data is on these visas specifically. One of the major impacts we know is that student visa. And of course, in July, when there was an order on restricting student visas, a lot of these issues got raised to the surface and brought us here today again. So the US, generally speaking, is the number one destination for foreign students. 1.09 million international students attend US universities. Um, here in this, here in the U.S., um, which far outpaces our next closest competitors, if you will, um, the U.K., Australia, and Canada are more are less than half of that international student load. Forty percent of the students here in the United States come from mainland China and Taiwan, but student visa issuances have decreased since 2015, as this chart shows you. Um, 2015, just over a million, and now in 2019. Um, it had a slight uptick from 2018 to 2019, but for the most part, it's a downward trend on the visa issuances, meaning who can come in um, to attend these universities. Just some more general international student statistics, why we'll get to why this matters, but about, like I said, there's that 1.09, there's the specific number right there, international students. 2018-2019 um, school year, um, 2020 data will come out at the end of November, so we're getting close to hearing what that was in 2019 slash 2020. 
Uh, we also know that international students attending community colleges in the U.S. was 86,351. In four, if you're curious, over three, uh, 300,000, just over 300,000 new F1, which is the traditional student visa, are issued annually by the United States government. So the, those are new students. Obviously, there's a disparity in that number, but those are new students. So every year, the new um, issuances are around 300,000. And I always, you know, one of the biggest challenges when we work sometimes in certain areas around the U.S., it's like, oh, it's not happening here. It's not happening in my backyard, but it is. So here's a map that shows you only 12 states in the U.S. have less than 5,000 international students attending their universities. So you can see this map and it's from, you know, east coast to west coast, north to south. There is international students in excess numbers participating in U.S. universities. And those in gray doesn't mean they don't have them. It just means they have less than 5,000 international students attending their universities. And one out of three international students studies in California, New York, or Texas. And here's what they reported on the percent change in new international students, which tracks with the data that we just read that showed the U.S. visa issuances were down since 2015. The new international students have taken a significant hit in the last, you know, since 2015 through 2019. Um, so this is, this all lines up, I promise. Why does this matter? I think it's important that we understand what the economic impact is of these international students here in the United States. $41 billion was brought in last year by those, in one year, by those international students at universities in the U.S. economy, which led to the support of 458,000 jobs in those communities where those um, universities are located. And an additional 2.6 billion was contributed by international students at community colleges. So it's not just, I don't have you know, UCLA in my backyard. No, but do you have a community college? Because that is also um, impacting um, the economy in these markets. And those community colleges additionally supported 13,970 jobs um, here in the United States. So they, the, the economic impact cannot be understated um, on, you know, when those visas get lessened and challenges arise, it's going to impact not just the university, but the economies that they support in their local markets. So this is NAR's research. Um, you won't find this graph in NAR's research. I cobbled it together. So every year in our large report, which can be found at nar.realtor slash research, if you we always ask um, the survey respondents, what is the intended use of the housing by the foreign buyer or seller? If you know what the intended use is. And here, every year, we, I went back and pulled that specific question out and you can see the decrease. Um, so this is the impact on the real estate market for those foreign buyers who are purchasing the home as the intended use for student housing. So in 2017, it was $6.1 billion was coming into the U.S. residential real estate market for specifically student housing. And in 2020, it's at $1.4 billion. So there's an impact um, simply stated on the real estate industry. And this is why this conversation is important. And I think why your chair and vice chair have led this conversation to where we are today. Another visa we know um, from our commercial respondents and from just paying attention to what's going on out there is the H-1B visa. And before we get into it, I wanted to explain what that visa was. Um, Russell, who's going to be mind blowing after I'm done, um, <laughs> we'll get into the specifics of them, but it is a specialized worker visa. It is good for three years, renewable for up to a maximum stay of six years here in the United States. 65,000 of these visas are issued annually with an additional pool of 20,000 for applicants who graduate with a master's or PhD from a U.S. university. So this is a highly specialized worker visa. And I grabbed a screenshot on the left-hand side, my left-hand side here, um, of what exactly those industries are. And this could, you could see, you can go all the way down to 200 industries. I grabbed the top, top 12. It's computer, computer sciences, medical and surgical, um, scientific research and development. And what I find most valuable in this information is the average salary there, which you can see is not a nominal amount of money. These, these um, individuals are making a very um, substantial wage. And if they're here for three years, for a maximum of six years, we started to think 
these probably are people that are investing in the local communities they live in, purchasing homes or renting home, whatever it is for them to live in. But it's it's probably a nicer, higher price point. What is the impact um, this visa has on our real estate industry? So this is where we started to look. And, you know, you have to understand if, if co corporations are hiring these um, workers, these highly specialized workers to contribute to their value proposition, um, you know, make them the, the best and the greatest. What if that visa category gets tightened and or removed from our um, options for our multinational corporations? And there was one study that found that U.S.-based multinational corporations responded to restrictions on the H-1B visas by increasing employment at their existing foreign affiliates and by opening new foreign affiliates, particularly in India, China, and Canada. So if we're trying to look into the future, into that magical, mystical um, ball we have that we don't we don't have, spoiler alert, um, you know, would new companies, if, if there were changes to this visa, would that essentially cause companies to stop looking on our shores to open their um, to open their doors and and um, you know go to Canada and then import the US workers from Canada from here to Canada or you know vice versa wherever the red tape was less and then how would that again have that trickle down effect into the United States and our economies both from the commercial side and the residential side and just to be clear there um, I know a lot of us think New York California California, you know, this this is where this must all be going to Silicon Valley. Those are the, where the highly specialized workers go for the computer and whatnot. But it's not true. 106 metro areas had at least 250 requests for H-1B workers. And the highest demand for these visas was in those cities listed on this slide here. Columbus, Indiana, which I always have to catch myself because I want to say Columbus, Ohio, and it's not. It's Columbus, Indiana, Durham, Durham Chapel Hill, Bloomington Normal, go Redbirds, that's where my university was, um, Ann Arbor, Michigan, Peoria, Boulder, Colorado, Boulder, Colorado, and Springdale Rogers, Arkansas. So those were the areas that had the highest demand. These are the um, tertiary markets where these um, multinational corporations are opening. And if you know, <laughs> if you're into colleges, you know that these are the places where those students are coming fresh out of their universities and the um, corporations are trying to attract that new and hot talent coming right out of those universities. And that tracks, again, when you see where the highest demand was. So we wanted to know what, after all of our speculation, after everything we think we know, what exactly do our members know, uh, say? What exactly is the impact that they're feeling on this? So we sent out a very informal questionnaire asking our members, a few questions and we wanted to share those results with you today. So as you can see, we asked them in the past 12 months, have you sold a home to a client on a US visa? We're speculating this is impacting you. Can you let us know if it is or not? We had about 215-ish responses and 30% of those respondents said, yes, I have sold a home to a client on a visa in the last 12 months. Okay, if you sold it to them, what visa were they on? And as you can see here, um, we may be smarter, a little bit smarter than the average bear, <laughs> because it tracked directly into that H-1B visa was at 14% of those that they sold. So you can see 60% 60 60 said they just didn't know what visa they were um, on, but 14% of the respondents said, "My the client I sold to was using an H-1B visa. There's the H-2B, which Claire talked about, um, NAR's policy stance on that um, last year, and the EB-5, along with the E-2 visas are... Um, some of the top. In the J, the exchange or visitor visa, we know that they, that's being impacted mainly by um, COVID and restrictions on um, travel and visitors and exchange programs. And so hopefully once we get to the other side of this, that impact um, will reverse itself. But the H-1B, EB-5, and H-2B are visas that we know have been um, restricted. And of course, there's a student visa there as well. Um, reported in. So we were on the right track with the visas we were trying to um, understand a little bit more. So great. You know what they were selling. What impact have you noticed on the ability to purchase a home due to changes in this policy in the last 12 months? Positive, negative. 42.8% have said they've had a negative impact on their client's ability to purchase a home due to um, changes in these visa and immigration policies. So we asked them to tell us, what do you want us to know? Is there anything you'd like to share? So these are just comments that came directly from our members. Um, and it should be known that a lot of them did say, 
um, they didn't have any impact. They didn't feel um, that there was anything negative going on, but the ones that had some concerns rise to the surface, these are the ones um, we wanted to share with you today. So you can see changes in policies have made it more difficult to purchase a home. Several clients with the H-1B visa are standing by to see if they will continue to have status in this country. All procedures are delayed, not just because of COVID. People are concerned about what seems to be the ever-changing immigration policies and therefore are questioning investing in the United States. I've noticed a lot of fear from buyers on H-1B visas because they are more than ever unsure about job security and residence in the United States. I am in commercial real estate and my foreign direct investment business is down 90% since 2016. So that particular member has really suffered in this front. Um, I have worked heavily with E2 and EB5 visa holders in the past. The ranging on the minimum amount of investment needed for EB5 investments have, in my opinion, hurt the U.S. foreign real estate market. While many factors are contributory, data suggests high net worth individuals from foreign nations have started favoring other developed nations, most notably Australia. So that was what um, our members told us. So that's why we're here today. So what are we going to do next? First, I'm going to say, I'm going to give a shout out. We're going to continue this conversation. So uh, Claire and I have kicked it off and here we are today, but we wanna continue this because obviously it is impacting. So if you have a global council at your state or local level and you feel like this issue is impacting your business, please reach out to that council, to the staff, to the volunteer leaders and let them know. Um, I regularly communicate with them. So gathering information from the local level is super important to us. And also um, most global councils um, are advised to work with their government affairs directors. And so if this is impacting your local market, your government affairs directors should be aware of how um, and why and what the current situation is. We're gonna continue to do more research with our research team here at NAR, and we're gonna continue these conversations as we dig deeper on the topic. But that's all I'm at, that's like I said, I'm setting the table for the next few of our speakers to come up in next, um, next up is going to be Russell Riggs, who's going to really get into um, NAR's advocacy um, efforts and, and the stances of most of these visas. So thank you for your time today and good luck, the rest of you. Thank, thank you so much, Lisa. That was, that was really good report and, and research. And um, to answer a couple of questions in the, in the chat box, yes, we will have the presentation to you within about a week or so. And uh, Lisa just stole my thunder of the great honor for me to, to introduce Russell Rick, who everybody, almost everybody know and, and familiar um, with him. He's a very valuable member of our, of our committee team. Um, Russell Rick is a uh, senior policy representative of NAR in Washington, DC. He actually lives uh, not too far away from me uh, for the past 23 years. Russell has advocated uh, on behalf of realtors on uh, energy, environment, property, property rights, visa, and natural resource issues before Congress and federal regulatory agencies. Russell also serves as the advocacy liaison to the uh, Realtor Land Institute, the NAR Global and Business Affairs Group, and NAR Resort and Second Home Group, Prior to his position with NAR, Russell held position with the U.S. Department of Energy, the National Governors Association, and the New Jersey Department of um, Environmental Protection. Russell holds a bachelor's degree from Virginia Commonwealth um, University, VCU, and a master's degree from uh, Turks University and New York University. He resides in, with his family in Fort Church, Virginia, and I will need another hour to to, to summarize everything about him. But um, with, with, with no further ado, take it on, Russell. <laughs> Thank you, Ty. Thank you, neighbor Ty. <laughs> we're, we're literally down the street from each other, practically. Um, thank you, Claire. Uh, thank you, Joe, for, uh, for this uh, invitation to speak before this uh, group on this webinar. Um, yeah, the, the visa issue has, has become uh, I would say, uh, in, from my perspective, for our members and for our real estate industry, I think more complicated in Washington, D.C. So I just want to give you a very brief kind of update and overview about where all these different issues that we track, that we have an interest in, 
uh, an economic interest in, but Lisa did a fantastic job to um, uh, describe and, and uh, uh, help us all understand the economic impact of these visas on the real estate industry and on NAR members. It's, it's significant. I don't think people, um, I think it's growing uh, amongst NAR and the industry, uh, just about how much these visa programs do have a positive impact uh, on communities across the country. And if you begin to limit their, uh, their value, their viability, uh, if there's fraud and abuse uh, in these programs, it limits the ability of, of that positive impact. So, so I'm here just to give you a brief uh, overview of where we are on some of these visas, uh, what's happening uh, in Washington, D.C. on the general overall issue of visas and immigration, and then um, try to uh, speculate a little bit about what I see happening in the future which is, I'll tell you right now, it's a little murky, but I'll give it a shot. <laughs> um, so let's, let's shoot for the, uh, the EB-5 investor visa. I think this is certainly one that, that uh, the committee, the Global Business Alliances Committee has talked about quite a bit. Uh, this is the one that uh, seems to garner the most attention and certainly, um, uh, certainly seems to be the one that uh, is having a big impact on communities across the country. Well, what is the EB-5 investor visa? Uh, in exchange for investing in a new US business, uh, $900,000 minimum and creating 10 jobs, foreign investors are placed on a path to US citizenship. Why does NAR support this visa? NAR supports it because these investments stimulate economic development, job creation and property ownership. And that has really been, um, you know, I think uh, of all the visas, this one has been a real success story because it really has allowed, um, you know, billions of dollars in investment since it was first created. Um, and people take advantage of it. And they understand that, first of all, there's um, job creation happening. Doesn't it, this, this visa doesn't work without job creation. Um, and there is economic development occurring as well. So it's really a win-win for, um, for the visa holder and also for the, uh, for the community. What's the current status? Well, as you know, we just had a big debate over the, uh, uh, whether or not the government is gonna be funded, uh, which seems to happen just about every year these days. Um, the program was funded through December 11th of 2020. Um, that's when we have, that's when Congress has to come back again for the lame duck to continually to continue uh, funding for the federal government. Um, there were some recent regs, uh, regulations uh, from the Department of Homeland Security that increased the minimum investment to that 900,000 figure that you see now. And it also provided more oversight. I think what we're concerned about there is the fact that um, we, th there's a very delicate line that you ha we have to walk in terms of making sure this program is viable and that uh, people can use it. But if you provide too much regulation, if you put in too much oversight, you make it too hard for people to use, they're not gonna use it and they're gonna go somewhere else. Like what Lisa just mentioned, uh, you know, go to other developed uh, countries such as Australia. So there's a real fine line that we have to walk in terms of curbing any fraud and abuse that might be occurring, but also making sure that the program is viable uh, and that people would want to use it. And that's where the reform bill comes in, the EB-5 Reform and Integrity Act, which we have supported. Uh, and that would basically do a lot of these, uh, modernizing the program, curbing fraud and abuse, understanding where the money is coming from, and how it's being used, uh, making sure that uh, appropriate job creation is happening and that those um, that is being tracked appropriately. Well, let's talk about the H2B Temporary Worker Visa Program. The H2B program, what is that? 
This program, visa program, uh, allows US employers to hire workers to fill temporary, usually six months, uh, seasonal and agricultural jobs in the US. Now, I, I really want to make a distinction here. This is not an immigration program, if you will. Uh, this is a temporary worker program. It allows workers to come in, uh, do their job, and then they go back home. So why does NER support this kind of a visa program? NER supports it because particularly in resort areas, housing developments, uh, it's very important to use these workers because they serve as uh, wait staff, lifeguards. If you go skiing, they'll be the, um, the ski lift operator. When you go to the beach in the summer, they're the lifeguards and other staff that keep these resort areas uh, humming, basically. And so it's very important for, for resort areas and large housing developments to have this staff available uh, to do this kind of work. Now, I, um, you know, there has been some criticism of this particular program. The criticism is, well, uh, they're taking jobs from American workers. Uh, 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 we need to offer these jobs to Americans before we start giving them to, uh, to foreign workers. And that is true to an extent, but the fact is employers have to go through all kinds of, jump through all kinds of hoops before they ever start using um, the H2B program. They have to advertise in uh, various social media and newspapers. The fact that they have jobs as a wait staff or a lifeguard, um, they have to make sure that they are uh, reaching out to their audience before they ever even uh, investigate using the H2B program. So there's a lot of, lot of hoops they have to jump through. Um, you know, another um, area with this particular, and I'm, you know, I live in Virginia. And so one of the big areas that uses, one of the big uh, industry sectors that uses the H2B program are the crab houses down in, um, on the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland. A big deal for them is, you know, having workers come in and sort the crab so they can have, you can have your delicious uh, crab cakes. They are decimated because a lot of these workers used, came in under the H2B program. And the fact is they could not find American workers to take those jobs. So, and they, they kept even increasing the, uh, the salaries and the, the hourly wage. And it, it just was not working. So a lot of those crab houses have now, uh, have now gone away or are not in, are not in business anymore. So that's just one small slice of how these H2B programs, uh, if they're not viable uh, and useful, can an in fact can uh, in fact impact in a positive, in a negative way uh, a particular industry sector. So what's the current um, the current status? Well, right now there is no um, comprehensive reform bill that has been introduced in Congress. Uh, the, the Department of Homeland Security recently approved an additional. 35,000 new H2B visas for FY 2020. And the fact is, this is a very popular program. 66,000 visas are available each year. And over the past five years, um, there have been new uh, visas approved every year because they go within a couple of months for the entire year. By March, they're usually all uh, sold out. Unfortunately, and we'll get into this later, um, this H2B program was suspended by a recent executive order, again, through 2020. The H1B Specialty Occupation Visa, and I want to, Lisa, fantastic job with grabbing all that, all that information and data. Thank you for that. That's fantastic. I'll just briefly go through it. What is this? Well, like Lisa said, this is a, applies to people who wish to perform services in a specialty occupation, as you saw, like the tech or the medical fields. And again, I mean, this is a no brainer in terms of why we would support something like this, because these investments uh, and, and these visa holders stimulate economic development, uh, job creation and property ownership. And that is what NAR 
is all about. So of course we're going to support support this. Uh, current status. Well, the new visas were suspended by the executive order. For those visa holders already in the country, just literally over the past um, month, new regulations will significantly restrict the ability of visa holders and employers to utilize this program. So we think that is a, a, a real issue. And uh, we want to see this H-1B specialty, specialty occupations visa uh, become more widely used. Uh, because as you, uh, as Lisa pointed out, if they can't open business offices here, multinational corporations are going to go somewhere else. Somewhere else where they, it makes it easier uh, to get workers, to get the workers they need uh, to do that work. And if they can't do it in the U.S., they're going to go somewhere else. And we're going to have, I think, a little bit of a brain drain going on where they're really smart people who are working in these tech and medical fields are going to other countries. And again, Lisa did a fantastic job with the, F, the F1 student visa. This applies to students who wish to study in the US. They must maintain a full course of study. And again, this is a, a no brainer from a policy perspective. Uh, NER supports these, uh, this student visa because these visa, visa holders rent and purchase property in which to live and study, especially around areas uh, of educational institutions. I mean, it was really actually kind of amazing the, the backlash that occurred when there was um, uh, an executive order uh, that actually suspended this particular program. And you saw um, uh, areas around Boston, uh, North Carolina, uh, Northern California, all these places. The one thing they had in common was they have a, a really dense uh, density of educational institutions. And they immediately realized the importance of uh, these uh, foreign students in supporting uh, and participating and contributing economically to their communities. So, uh, you know, the backlash, everyone saw it. You saw the backlash that occurred. And currently, this visa is indeed operational. So let's talk a little bit about the White House, White House executive order. Went into effect in June, uh, June 24th, suspended a variety of visa categories, including the H-1B visas, H-2B, the L visas, which restricts foreigners transferring to, U, to U.S. office in a multinational corporation, J-1 visas that restricts people from participating in cultural and, and other kinds of activities, a key exception does not affect immigrants who are already in, um, in the country, existing visa holders, temporary workers in food production, healthcare workers, and researchers fighting COVID-19. So I, you know, I think there, there, there was an understanding that um, these visas do have value. Um, there was an understanding that they contribute, but I think the, the overriding kind of the underlying reason why they went forward with this executive order was, listen, our, our uh, uh, Americans are hurting and we need to maximize their ability to get any job possible. And um, I think we, we appreciate that, but we also understand uh, the fact that these visas have far reaching impacts throughout our communities, particularly when it comes to property rental and property ownership. And so um, from our perspective, limiting that will impact the real estate industry and will impact our members. So we need to, we need to, to have a place at the table and make sure our voice is heard with that. What's gonna happen in the future? The magic eight ball says, ask again later. Um, this issue is, um, you know, has now been caught up in politics, as everyone knows. Uh, it has been, if not a major um, campaign issue, kind of one simmering in the background, as opposed to 2016 when it was a major 
certainly immigration and visa issues were certainly a major uh, campaign issue. Um, you know, hey, it depends who gets elected president. Uh, if Trump is reelected, I anticipate he will um, continue on with these uh, suspensions. Uh, I, I anticipate he will continue to restrict and narrow the ability of employers and uh, foreign nationals to uh, uh, be able to take advantage of these visas and come in and do work in the US. Um, and I, I think for him and for his administration, it's about jobs and maximizing the ability of American workers to get work because uh, you know American workers are hurting. There's no question about that. Um, so I think that's, that's the lens that he is seeing this issue through. Um, I think if you have a Biden administration, you know, I think he will um, reverse uh, all of these executive orders and not just this one, but all, you know, the executive orders that have been, you know, and that's, um, all presidents do that. that. That's just not a Trump or a Biden issue. Presidents, when they come in, wipe the, wipe the slate clean to the extent they can uh, in terms of executive orders and those kinds of things. Now, um, the regulatory aspect of it may be a little bit harder and take longer to overturn. Uh, when you have regulations that have gone through due process, gone through the um, appropriate Administrative Procedures Act process to be finalized, that's a much more difficult um, uh, government action to overturn than just uh, wiping the slate clean by, exec by getting rid of all the executive orders. A, reg a regulation is a very different animal um, and will take much more time to, to overturn and, and get rid of those. But again, uh, you know, November 4th uh, is when we will know how some of this uh, stuff is going to shake out. And um, like I said, the magic eight ball says, ask again later. So with that, I think I will um, thank you and I believe I will stop sharing my screen and look forward to any questions at the end of the other speaker's presentation. So thank you. Wonderful, Russell. Um, thank you for that uh, sobering information. It, uh, it's, it is very important. We, we see both sides, but I mean, it has such a tremendous impact on our business um, and on most of our lives, really, to be honest. Um, so keeping that in mind, Lisa did a great job kind of building the platform. Russell's done a great job to tell us what's happening um, at, the, at the White House or, or not. Um, and next we have a speaker that's in a complementary um, industry. And as you all know, it's, it's a vital alley in the global real estate transaction. We're honored to have Jason Finkelman from uh, Austin, Texas. And Jason, just a little bit of information about Jason so you're ready for um, his presentation. Um, Jason's an immigration attorney, so again, very, very, very timely and important. Um, and he's working with um, domestic and foreign businesses, as well as international individuals in a variety of employment based and family based immigration matters. He represents the US and international companies and uh, entrepreneurs, investors, business owners, executives, professionals skilled workers, students, and families in obtaining employment visas, lawful permanent residence, green cards, and US citizenships. Jason has worked with his clients across a number of industries, pretty spectacular actually, um, including high tech, semiconductor, healthcare, higher education, energy, oil and gas, import export, research, video game, as well as professional athletic athletes. Uh, music and entertainment to help them meet their immigration goals. Jason continues to be at the forefront of immigration law. So beforehand, could you just check him out and take this down? We'll have it in the notes as well, but it's www.finkelmanlaw.com. So it's F-I-N-K-E-L-M-A-N-Law.com. Jason, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you for that nice, warm introduction. I appreciate that. I'm going to share my screen there. Can everyone see that? Are we good on that? Sweet. Um, yeah, no, thank you for that introduction. And, and thanks again to, to Joe and NAR for, for having me out. Um, also a special shout out to Christine Wren 
uh, with the Austin Board of Realtors. She, she's doing an excellent job in the global front and, and, and helping organize lots of uh, events similar to this. Um, <laughs> I've been tasked here with going over, uh, again, some of the immigration policy changes that have taken place over the last three and a half years and how they are impacting um, not only all of you and your businesses, but your clients as well. Um, and I've been tasked to do that in less than 15 minutes. So this is going to be really quick, really short and, and very general. Um, uh, so, uh, without further ado, let's let's jump into this. And and frankly, it's going to start by echoing um, a lot of what was discussed in the previous uh, uh, presentations, which were great by by Lisa and Russell. Um, but this all really starts with April 2017, when uh, President Trump issued something called the Buy American, Hire American Executive Order. And simply put, at the beginning of his presidency, he said, look, I don't actually have the power to change immigration laws. That takes an act of Congress to do that. But in my very limited power, uh, I have the ability to enact policies uh, around these immigration laws. And through executive order, I am signing this, this document called the Buy American, Hire American executive order, which says I, President Trump, am directing uh, the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, uh, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, the Department of Labor, and, and, and all of those agencies to do everything in their power to make sure they are, quote, protecting uh, American jobs and American security. And it was a very sort of vague document. Well, since April 2017, everything that has been talked about in, in the, the previous presentations really has, has, has uh, um, uh, generated or, or, or started really from this April 2017 Buyer American, Higher American Executive Order to the tune of over 400 executive orders as it pertains to immigration. Let me repeat that. Over four hundred executive orders and policy changes as it pertains to immigration. That's a lot. So how do we sum up what has happened? As you've sort of seen in the previous slides, it has led to massive, massive increase of scrutiny over visa petitions and applications. Simply put, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, USCIS, the consulates and embassies outside the US, and even the customs and border protection officers, the men and women at ports of entries and airports, are now doing everything in their power to scrutinize visa applications, visa petitions, and entry into the US more so than they have ever done previously. And they have done that in part by redefining the eligibility requirements for visas and for lawful permanent residents or green cards and even for citizenship. Those, those uh, agencies don't actually have the power to, to change the immigration laws, but through policy changes, they are now making it significantly more difficult for people to obtain these, these visas. So, tagging again off of the, the previous slides, what, what has happened? Number one, and, and I think the most important thing to take away, and I think Lisa just hit the nail on the head with one of, one of the last slides in her presentation, but there has been massive, massive unpredictability in immigration executive orders and the decisions by immigration officers, which is making buyers skittish. I see that in my practice, simply with people going, wait a sec, I don't know if I want to come to the US because frankly, I don't know if I'm going to be able to stay. And by stay, we're talking about non-immigrant visas, which means I don't know if I'm going to be able to stay three months, six months, one year, three years. We're not talking about forever. People don't know if they're going to be able to stay temporarily. And so people say, well, why do I want to make the effort and, and, and pay all the money and go through all the, the headaches to come to the U.S. when I'm only going to be able to stay for six months, three months, maybe not even longer. 
And I think that immigrants who have long been a pillar of growth in home buying in this country, frankly, are not feeling the warm welcome and optimism that they have in previous years, which are necessary to making a big purchase like a home. We are seeing this in particular in markets that have high concentrations of highly skilled foreign-born home buyers. We are seeing this with home ownership, home ownership rates from these foreign nationals dipping because of their concern over the unpredictability in, in immigration matters. I can say that my, my clients are nationwide. So I have clients in Austin, Texas, where I'm at here. I see that in San Francisco, in New York, in the big cities, and in some of the medium-sized cities that Lisa was talking about in her presentation. You are seeing people all the way from starting off as students go, I don't know if I want to make this commitment of coming to the US if I don't have a pathway of staying even temporarily, um, because what's the point of going through all that? And I think you're seeing that impacting uh, um, home purchase uh, uh, dramatically uh, uh, with these foreign nationals. Um, some of the recent changes we're seeing in, in terms of high skilled visa restrictions, like was what was talked about in previous slides with the H-1B visa, um, and in, in restrictions to employment-based lawful permanent residence or green cards, pathways to stay in perma permanently, um, is that the government has made it harder for people to obtain these visas and expensive for employers to, to hire the talent they need. Whether that talent is skilled, as in people who have professional degrees coming to perform in professional level positions, or in unskilled uh, 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 positions, those positions that do not require a bachelor's degree to perform uh, the functions of the position. So because it is now more expensive, and because the government is making it harder for US employers to hire whoever they want, it's making it more challenging for those employers to say, well, I'm going to go through that effort to bring this talent to, to the US to help me grow my business. And without that talent here, it's hurting the economy. It's also hurting the home buying market. Uh, I was recently reading an interesting article um, from the National Association of Home Builders that was talking about uh, a recent change within the last several months uh, uh, regarding uh, public charge documents. There's, there's a new uh, uh, application that any foreign national will need to complete uh, that shows that they are coming to the U.S. and won't become a public charge. They won't be taking public benefits, welfare, things like that, um, which is a fine application to, to, to have and, and an important one. But what the National Association of Home Builders is saying is that this new application is leading to a shortage of construction workers. Well, this shortage of construction workers is now driving up the costs of single family homes and multifamily developments. And so again, impacts like that may not necessarily hurt uh, uh, the, the foreign national, but it's hurting US employers and ultimately all of us and all of our clients ability uh, uh, to afford uh, single family homes or, or multifamily developments. Lastly, you're seeing pandemic travel restrictions as all of us uh, have been aware, just watching the news over the last eight plus months. Um, it's hard to come to this country right now because there are massive travel restrictions to enter this country due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And that is also uh, making foreign nationals skittish of just coming to this country to even explore, entertain home buying or home purchases. Um, and we see that as a, as a trend, at least for the immediate future um, due to the pandemic. Quickly, we've talked about EB-5 in the past presentations, but, but it, it bears repeating, and, and I, I know there's some questions about this probably in, in, in the question and answer section, but just so we're, we're clear, in, in November 2019, the EB-5 program, which is the Immigrant Investor Visa Program, was amended um, so that the amount investors must now spend is not just $900,000, it's 
$8 million in certain types of jobs that are going to create jobs for or certain types of businesses that are going to create jobs for 10 US workers or $900,000 in targeted employment areas. Targeted employment areas are either rural locations or areas with unemployment that is at least 150% of the national average. In addition to that, uh, in January of this year of 2020, USCIS announced that it would change how it processes EB-5 applications. Previously, USCIS reviewed EB-5 applications on a first in, first out basis, but is now shifting to a, a what they call a visa availability approach. Um, very generally, ex explanation of what that means is investors typically have a place in line that's determined by something called a priority date, which is uh, uh, the date uh, defend, defend, dependent family members uh, can obtain what's called a conditional green card or lawful permanent resident card. Um, and they can't get their green card until their priority date becomes current according to a Department of State visa bulletin. Um, and so there's a backlog of people waiting to get their green cards through this investor program. Um, and so those are two major changes that I think have foreign uh, investors skittish about investing in the EB-5. Additionally, um, we're seeing over the past year, especially EB-5 investments slowing down partly due to new regulations in China that discourage the wealthy from investing in foreign projects. Um, there's been proposed bills that would roll back some uh, of these requirements, including the, these long wait times that I was talking about uh, for visas by allowing investors to move to the US on, on temporary work authorization ahead of, a, of an approved immigrant visa or green card, um, but that's yet, yet to happen. Um, and the other thing on this EB-5 front is just a common sense sort of practical thing, but with any of these EB-5 projects, they have to create jobs for 10 US workers. Well, as we all know, the economy right now is not great here. And I think the biggest concern right now for anyone who is considering utilizing the EB-5 program is the potential lack of job creation, particularly in order the, those direct projects that are more at risk than the regional center projects, those, those projects that are the, the $1.8 million investment. So I think those are the big concerns right now. Um, you know, what, what Russell was saying in, in the previous slide was, we don't know what lies ahead. Um, you know, certainly I, I would agree with Russell that if, if President Trump is reelected, things will get harder and things will be more restrictive to, to foreign nationals. I think that that's, that's unequivocal. Should the president not be reelected? I agree. I, I don't think that all of a sudden overnight, things are going to go back to the way they were in 2016, or things are going to be even easier than they were. Because, you know, to, to unwind the more than 400 executive actions that President Trump has taken to restrict immigration is going to be a lengthy process. So advice to your clients or advice to any of you working with foreign nationals going forward is that one, if, if, if things continue on the same path they have been, my, my hunch is it will get harder for foreign nationals to come to, this U, to the US and, and or to make investments. If he is not reelected, I suspect it will be a slow, long, unwinding process. And hopefully there, there will be policies in place uh, to allow uh, employers to hire the talent they need to grow their business, to allow talented foreign nationals uh, uh, to enter this country, and, and to continue making investments that have been the, the, the pillar of growth for our country in years past. That's my rushed, quick synopsis of all that. I will hand it over. If anyone has any questions, you can see my contact information there. Um, and again, thank you uh, for having me out. And thanks for all of you for, for attending. Thank you so much, Jason. Thank you very much. That was great information. And, and don't go away. I mean, at the end of all the presentation, we have, uh, we have you answer a lot of questions. 
Uh, our last speaker of today, but not least at all, is from a complementary industry, and his work is very important. It leads to many real estate opportunities for our members. So I have a great pleasure to um, introduce Christopher Chung. Christopher Chung joined the Economic Development Partnership of North Carolina, the EDP NC, as Chief Executive Officer in 2015. Chris brings more than 20 years of state level economic development experience to his role. As a public private partnership, um, the EDPNC is responsible for a number of economic development functions on behalf of the state of North Carolina, including new business recruitment, existing business support, international trade, export assistance, small business startup counseling and tourism, sports, and film promotion. With a staff of more than 60 professionals and an annual operating budget of more than $24 million, the EDP and C is focused on advancing the economic interests of North Carolina, 100 counties, and more than 10 million residents. While Chris previously held various executive and management responsibilities at the Missouri Partnership, from 2007, 2004 to uh, uh, 2014. And the, the Ohio Department of Development, now known as Jobs Ohio from 1997 to 2007. Chris attended the Ohio State University, uh, OSU, graduate um, Phi Beta Kappa with a double major in Japanese and economics. He also completed significant coursework towards the master's in public policy and management. He and his wife, Emily, reside, currently reside in Raleigh, North Carolina. Now, please take it away, Chris. Great, thank you very much, Ty. Uh, good afternoon uh, for those of you who are uh, in the Eastern time zone like myself. Uh, good morning uh, for everyone else who's uh, a little further west of here. Uh, really a, a privilege to be with you all. Uh, first off, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of the program. Thank you for everything that you all do uh, as the National Association of Realtors. I know in recent years, uh, NAR, as well as all the different state realtors associations have been working hard to foster more collaboration with the economic development industry. I know here in North Carolina, uh, we're very privileged to enjoy a strong uh, support and partnership with the North Carolina Association of Realtors, and, and they really are very complementary industries. I think we're all going after the same thing. Uh, it just success may look a little bit differently as we define it for our respective industries, but ultimately that objective is the same, which is, I, I think, why that collaboration makes so much sense. So uh, as part of that, I really appreciate you all uh, extending the invitation for me to, to come on here today. Uh, my job uh, in the, the 10 or 12 minutes, I'm going to try to shorten uh, the time that I was allotted so we can still leave some time for Q&A. Um, is it really just to provide some context in terms of what we see from the economic development side of things as it pertains uh, to the, the uh, expertise that you heard from all of the speakers before me. I, I am not an immigration uh, expert, uh, not an expert in visa laws or visa policies, uh, but as you'll hopefully uh, hear, we do see the impacts of some of these policies as they affect economic development. You know, in a, a diverse economy like North Carolina has, you, you can definitely see where uh, the impacts of national immigration policy really play out in ways that affect, of course, the work that we do as an economic development organization, but all different facets of our state economy, which are important. You, and any of you who've spent time in North Carolina, you know that we're home to world-class universities, whether that's a, a Duke University, a UN University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, Wake Forest, Elon. We've got some amazing universities here, those international students that you talked about and the, the visa and immigration laws that allow them to come over here and spend their formative years at our academic institutions. That's a big part of our economy. We have a very thriving tourism economy here in North Carolina, right? We're bookended on both sides of our state by the Smoky Mountains and the Blue Ridge Mountains in the West uh, to the Outer Banks and 320 miles of coastline to the East. It's a state that enjoys a, a wonderful natural environment, which means we have a very robust tourism economy, which again, depends on some of those uh, immigrate, uh, immigrant uh, workers who come over to support our tourism and hospitality sectors. Uh, even sectors like agriculture and healthcare, which are also big here in North Carolina, uh, as you saw in some of the previous remarks, uh, a lot of the workers in those different fields 
uh, do come into the U.S. either on short-term or longer-term visas. And of course, all of that is a, a you know, fundamental part of our state economy. So this really is an issue that weaves into uh, economic development writ large. I'm going to focus more specifically on the work that we do uh, at the EDPNC. And as you heard from Ty's uh, introduction of me. Our organization, uh, depending on what state you live in, some of your states may have a, a traditional government agency like a, a Department of Commerce or a Department of Economic Development. Uh, some of you may be in states like North Carolina that take more of a, a different approach to this at the state level. Uh, so here in North Carolina, we're not a state agency. We're a public-private nonprofit organization, so a 501c3, but we have a contract with the state of North Carolina to do the type of economic development work that used to sit within a government agency. So that's a, a relatively new change for us. Uh, that was adopted about six years ago, uh, so shortly before I moved into uh, my role here. But more important than that is what exactly are we doing on behalf of North Carolina? Uh, you heard a little bit about that from Ty. Uh, our work touches everything from helping North Carolina manufacturers to export more of their products around the world, to marketing North Carolina as a great leisure and travel destination, again, supporting that very healthy tourism economy me that we enjoyed uh, at least before the pandemic, which that's a story for a different time, but obviously tourism has taken a major hit uh, because of COVID-19. Uh, what I'm gonna focus my uh, time today though on is uh, business recruitment. So that's probably what we get the most uh, visibility and attention for in our line of work uh, here in North Carolina, which is trying to attract companies to set up new operations here in our state. And a good chunk of that work historically has been foreign direct investment. So I know foreign direct investment can take a lot of different forms. Many of the real estate industry, that may be an individual investor who's purchasing uh, residential real estate or commercial real estate. It could be a, 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 a fund overseas that's looking to diversify its holdings and put uh, investment capital into real estate projects here. For the purposes of our world uh, in economic development, when we talk about foreign direct investment, vast majority of the time, we are talking about uh, greenfield investment or uh, owner occupied facilities. So this would be a, a foreign manufacturer that has uh, decided that the US is a, an appealing enough market where that company needs to set up a production facility here in the US. I, I'd say that's the majority of the type of foreign investment that we're working on at any given time. It's a really important growth strategy for us in economic development. Uh, foreign companies in North Carolina, they employ about a quarter million North Carolinians. So it's a really sizable chunk of our job creation sector. We have five offices overseas, India, China, Korea, Japan, and Europe, all focused on getting in front of foreign companies that may be looking to set up operations in the US. And of course, we want them to look at North Carolina. Of course, we ultimately want them to locate in North Carolina. So um, in terms of the ramifications of visa and immigration policy, it's really kind of two areas. It's at, it's at a micro level and a macro level. Uh, I'd say at a micro level, you've got issues around EB-5 project activity. You all, of course, have, have heard about EB-5 touched on during today's presentation. We don't deal as much in that type of investor activity. Again, it's a little bit, it's structured a little bit differently than what organizations like ours are able to tend to. We are, again, focused on those foreign companies that are looking to set up new operations that they will own, operate, and manage here in the United States. For us, one of the biggest challenges that uh, these visa and immigration issues have presented, uh, especially as those standards have, uh, standards have gotten tighter, the scrutiny has gotten greater, uh, is it's really starting to affect uh, knowledge transfer. Uh, when foreign companies, uh, it doesn't matter if it's a German company, a Japanese company, a Chinese company, when they're looking to set up operations here in the United States uh, for manufacturing, for example, to get that facility up and going, to ramp it up so that it can be as productive as they envision it to be, utilizing largely a locally hired workforce, oftentimes that's going to mean bringing over managerial or engineering talent from wherever the parent company happens to be. Because again, remember, a lot of the companies we deal with, this is their first foray into establishing production or localization of operations in the US market. And so it's already daunting enough to navigate the web of taxes, laws, and regulations that the US introduces. But just the knowledge transfer around how that company approaches things like quality control, uh, how they establish all their different uh, operations, that oftentimes leans on expertise that they need to bring over from overseas to enable a successful launch of that operations. Um, before today, I, I pulled up just a few letters of support 
uh, that, that we've drafted for companies that we have worked with, uh, helping them to try to navigate immigration and visa uh, issues that they've just sort of been stuck on at the federal level. And again, a lot of this has happened, I'd say, probably within the last year and a half or two years. At least that's that's looking at the letters of support that we've been asked by these companies to draft. Uh, you know, I've got a French company here. It's in biotechnology. They were trying to get their VP of corporate development over here, uh, again, to assist with launching uh, this new 200 job facility that they would be putting here in the research triangle region. Uh, you've got a Japanese automotive parts manufacturer. They were looking to bring over an R&D manager from Japan, which would allow them to essentially uh, match up their product development cycle a little bit better with this market that they're now established in. Again, something was holding up their visa application. Uh, a German company, uh, again, engineering controls and mechatronics, that was a lot about that knowledge and skills transfer to help train the local workforce in the ways that this German company wanted to get this facility up and going, also running into issues uh, getting that visa process cleared. And so uh, that's probably indicative of the broader trends that you heard from some of the, the subject matter experts earlier on the call, but we certainly see some of that uh, down at, at the level where we're operating. And it, it does have that ability to potentially uh, disrupt and adversely affect the productivity and ultimate performance of these companies as they ramp up these very important investments in the US. So of course, in a perfect world, all of those things would sail through the process quickly. Those companies would be able to bring the talent in on a short-term basis to help with those facilities. Uh, but but that's we haven't seen that 100% of the time when it talks about foreign direct investment. Uh, broader, uh, and I'll just wrap up with this before we go to Q&A, at, at a macro level, like I said, for economic developers, I think some of the concerns around broader immigration and visa policy have to do with talent availability. We are still, even in this uh, period of much higher unemployment than we've had in a long time, we are still seeing employers in certain sectors have a very difficult time attracting and hiring the type of talent they need to be successful. So it tells us that there are still very prominent skills gaps among the workforce, which cannot always be addressed, unfortunately, by domestic workers. And so to the extent that uh, immigration policies allow that influx of foreign talent uh, to help American companies and foreign employers operating in the U.S., to be successful with their operations. You know, I think talent really is the lifeblood of every industry and immigration is part of the ways that companies look at solving the talent solution. Good, bad, or indifferent. Again, folks can debate that, but until we can produce enough domestically of the skill sets that all of our employers need to supplement that with immigrant uh, talent is, there's certainly nothing bad from that from an economic development standpoint. Uh, we've seen things like incentives pushback when it comes to state economic incentives. Uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, our legislature basically said, look, if you're a company and you're hiring H-1B employees, those jobs that you create will no longer be counted for the purposes of determining state incentives. So it actually negatively affects those companies that are unable to hire domestically. Uh, and in order to be as productive as they want, they'd have to supplement it with H-1B. I, I get the argument that this is about North Carolinians going to work for North Carolina companies, but in the short term, that could really be somewhat counterproductive. Uh, and then last but not least, I think someone touched on it earlier. I think immigration policies ultimately are proxy for how welcome and an, of a business environment a country has to offer. And I think the US has long been that beacon for innovators, entrepreneurs, and, and people from all over the world. And our immigration policies can have a, a positive or negative effect depending on how they're structured in terms of continuing to depict the United States as that welcoming environment where everyone can come and be successful as a business or as an individual. So like I said, these are things that I think we think about on the economic development side of things. So with that, Ty, um, I'll, I'll throw it back to you, but appreciate being part of the panel. Look forward to the questions. Thank you very much, Chris. And Clay, I'm gonna take on um, some Q&A. Yeah, um, thank you, thank you to all of our panelists today. Um, it's uh, there's never enough time to to continue to learn and to hear from your perspectives, and we really, really appreciate your time to to educate and to teach us. Um, we're going to open it up. We've still have uh, we're great on time. Thank you everybody for that. Um, we've a, a couple of questions here. What I'll do is I'll take them in order. Um, and um, Jason, if you're still there, I guess that there's a, I'm not sure if it's a question or a statement, but 
um, that there are 15,000 individual families on the wait list for the EB5. And um, uh, did they raise the minimum financial requirement to 1 million to be a part of the program for their green card? Yeah, that's what we talked about in the presentation. So they did raise the requirement now. It's, it's 1.8 million for direct investment projects and $800,000. Um, it was raised basically from 1 million to 1.8 and from $500,000 to $800,000 uh, in projects uh, in targeted areas of uh, unemployment. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And um, the next question, perhaps uh, Russell could take this. Do you know if the EB-5 applications have fallen since raising the minimum investment amount? Uh, I, I don't know for sure. I would open it up to the panel to see if they have any insights into um, uh, the rates of EB-5 applications and if they've gone up or gone down. I don't know specifically. I can't speak to the, the, that statistic. Um, I don't know. I can tell you in my practice, yes, I have seen way less people uh, taking on EB-5 investment projects, uh, especially over the past year with the changes that happened in November 2019. Right. I mean, that would make sense to me that it, it has been decreasing only because of the, uh, the uncertainty of whether the EB-5 program is going to be uh, viable from one continuing resolution to the next. You know, um, the government has been operating on a uh, semi-temporary basis. And so every time you have a question about whether the government's gonna shut down or, or if the government does indeed shut down, uh, that means the EB-5 program is shut down. And that means um, there's uncertainty uh, about the whole program. So uh, I'm, I don't know the exact uh, statistical information, but certainly uh, uh, would follow that there would be a decrease in the utilization of that program. Since we're on EB-5, uh, there, there are two, two questions here. We're going to just um, put it out there. Uh, the first question, particularly for Jason, is with the changes with EB-5, have you seen more requests for L1 visa or E2? What trends do you see? And then the second question, Russell, is a long question, so Russell can take that. Yeah. Uh, the, the first question is, yes, definitely, there are more uh, foreign nationals. And, and I think that, that's always been the case, even, even prior to recent changes, uh, that foreign nationals that may not just be looking at a way to buy themselves a, a green card through making an investment in the U.S. is utilizing the L1A visa, uh, especially those that are entrepreneurial that, say, have a, a business abroad and want to uh, a start a, a U.S. subsidiary affiliate or branch office and transfer themselves uh, to the U.S. On, on an L-1A visa. And for E-2 individuals from certain countries that have a, a treaty with the U.S., unfortunately, China and India are not eligible for the, the E-2 visa, along with a host of other countries, um, using that E-2 visa as a pathway to uh, come to the U.S., make an investment, hire local workers, uh, uh, and, and be here temporarily. Currently, policies make it uh, more difficult to obtain lawful permanent residence or a green card through E2. So I, I suspect those on the call that get questions about EB5 and E2, those are always, always confused, um, rightly so. Um, they're two completely different visa categories. Um, and the E2, you know, for anyone that has a client that's asking about that, usually you say E2 is great for making an investment, um, but is currently not a, a great pathway to, to permanent residency. The L1A is, is usually a better pathway to that. And certainly going to, either of those are going to be uh, less expensive and more flexible to get you here quicker uh, working uh, than the EB-5 program. Okay, thank you. Russell, you wanna take the second one? Sure, I think it was a question related to the interaction with uh, the DHS with all the other, with some of the other visa programs and what their role is. Um, sure, well, there, there is interaction um, with DHS and all the visa programs so that um, they, are, they know who is coming into the country. They've done various background checks, et cetera, on them. So 
uh, I think there was a fear of, uh, I think that the questioner was a, it's a question of, is there a, a terror, an issue with letting terrorists into the country? I think, uh, you know, they've learned their lessons from, from past uh, events and don't want to see that happen again. So that's why DHS is very involved in, in making sure that people that are coming over are, are safe and not going to do the U.S. harm. Great. Um, the next one is a question in regards to um, the H-1 status of clients of uh, one of our uh, participants that moved to the United States from India probably uh, over just over 15 years ago in the technology industry. Um, they have two children and they have contributed to the communities they live in as well as property tax, federal tax, um, that they're still living in the U.S. with the fear of not being able to get a permanent, to get permanent citizenship. Um, they continue to live in fear for, of not getting their work visa renewed. Do any of the panelists have any suggestions on how to work through the process? Maybe that's something we could talk offline to and it's quite specific, but is there anything in general that we could um, help with that quite answer? Yeah, Claire, I, I think you, you said that that's more of a specific question that has specific answers that are unique to that, that person's uh, uh, case. But uh, I can say that I understand that fear. And I think as, as all of the panelists sort of intimated, it, there's a lot of fear for foreign nationals right now about being here in the US. And so um, I, I, I sympathize, um, but if you have specific questions, you know, certainly you can, you can reach out directly. To me. Okay, great. Yeah, Claire, and I'll, I'll chime in here. Um, I mean, in terms of action, you know, recourse, like I said, a different situation than what the questioner is asking about. But like I said, for a lot of the companies that we interact with, foreign companies looking to make investments here where they're stuck on some part of the visa application process, be it an, an E2, L1, uh, we've had good luck. And it may be just the type of organization that we're set up to be uh, working through our U.S. Senate uh, offices. Of course, you know, both of our senators, uh, you know, I, I think folks will return their calls more quickly if it's uh, coming, you know, heading over to a USCIS matter. And so in those cases where a company is running into a legitimate issue, getting some of their folks uh, situated over here in the United States and where job creation potential is potentially being compromised, uh, it, it's worked out very well for us to appeal to our congressional delegation to help uh, at least fast track uh, some of these applications in a way that will resolve the matter more quickly for those corporations. Well, that's great information. Thank you. And uh, there's a lot of people in the same situation and similar to situations, just different. Um, so we appreciate that. Um, there was a comment. Wow, Christopher, excellent content and right on point. We totally agree. Okay. We work with Japanese companies here in Houston, and that is exactly what's happening here, too. So thank you very much for your presentation. Um, last question that we have uh, up here at the moment is, uh, well, another one coming in. Um, the L1 visa was temporarily suspended as well, correct? Yeah, so uh, in July uh, of this year, uh, President Trump issued a, another executive order that temporarily suspended the issuance of certain non-immigrant visas for certain foreign nationals. And Russell uh, highlighted this, and I think Lisa highlighted it in her presentation as well, through December 31st uh, of this year. So currently, individuals that are uh, applying at a uh, foreign consulate for an L1A visa today would not be able to have that visa issued uh, until that executive order goes away. However, you know, the process of preparing any visa application is, is not one size fits all. It's not quick, it's not easy. And it takes a while to put together those applications. So in, at least in my practice, I do not see uh, individuals that are seeking to enter the US in early 2021 uh, from not getting those petitions ready here in the U.S., filing those petitions, getting them approved with USCIS here so that they are ready, knock on wood, starting you know, January 1st uh, uh, to obtain their L1A at the consulate and enter the U.S. and begin working. So um, that's the long answer to your question. <laughs> no, it's great. Thank you. Um, do students still have to return home on F1 visas before applying to come back and wait two years at least? No, that's, that's not the case with F1 visas. There are certain J1 visas that are subject to a two-year home residency requirement. F1 uh, students currently are eligible to remain in the U.S. so long as they are enrolled in a full-time course of study. Um, and in some cases, they may be able to change their status to some other non-immigrant status like an H-1B or 
some other non-immigrant visa, um, but there's no requirement that they return home to their country for two years before getting another visa. Great. Um, another question, um, and Joe might be able to jump in on this one too. So what are the overall thoughts about what we can do as the real estate industry uh, or NIR when it comes down to the immigration policies? I'm in Houston. I have experienced how the foreign national real estate investment have been affected by the current immigration policies. By the way, great presentation. Thanks very much, Nelly. But we'll see if we can answer your questions. Uh, sure, I'll jump in real quick. Um, and then I think I'll let Russell wrap this up. And the truth is, you know, Claire, you mentioned this in the very beginning with the work that we did last year with the H2B visa. Our first and foremost goal is to serve our 1.4 million members in the US and ensure that they are able to do business with foreign investors that are coming into the country. So we wanna make sure that everything that's out there that our advocacy team and everybody that's working on these issues understand what the goals of our members are. With that being said, we are in full support of making sure that these programs are run um, transparently, making sure that everyone that's using these programs are doing it and abiding by the law. Um, we don't just want to open it up for the sake of opening it up. We want to kind of serve all of the parties involved here, including the U.S. government, but we want them to understand what we're doing and why we're doing it and how it impacts the overall um, foreign direct investment picture in the U.S. So, Russell, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I mean, I think, um, you know, I think we're doing a lot right now. We're, we're adding our voice to um, concern about, uh, re, you know, overly restricting these visa programs. Uh, we're making our voice known in Washington about the fact that these are important to us and to the real estate industry. I don't think we've really done that before. Um, I think this is a very new issue for us, um, but we certainly made our made our voice heard. We're uh, participating in coalitions that are engaged in um, uh, in supporting these visa programs. We're engaging in additional research, uh, collecting additional data about how this affects realtors and communities across the country. So I think we're really building the case that. Uh, we need to support these visa programs and make sure they're viable, make sure they have accountability, uh, and make sure that uh, they're modernized and trying to weed out to the extent we can fraud and abuse, supporting legislation that supports those goals. But uh, understanding that um, these visa programs play an important role in economic development, job creation, and property ownership, which is what NAR is all about. So. Great. Ty, did you have a question? I do have a question uh, for Chris. Um, and um, um, some states have the economic development uh, division, like like what you have in North Carolina. And um, like Virginia does have that too. But I really want to see from your perspective, how our members, our realtor members, are going to work hand in hand with your organization to bring the um, more, more, um, uh, investment into their state. So how, let's say that their state has something like, like you have in North Carolina, how do we reach out to, how, how do we contact? Give me some first step to do. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I would say it probably starts with the conversation because again, there's economic development organizations operating at a state level, uh, oftentimes at a regional level. So usually it's a metropolitan area. Uh, and then of course at the local level. So whether that's a county, whether that's a city, oftentimes you often see a, a local economic development corporation or sometimes it's done out of a chamber of commerce. And of course the needs and opportunities for collaboration are gonna vary really case by case for us, uh, we interact a lot with the real estate community, more industrial and office realtors, because that's the, the bulk of the types of, of deals that we are working on. Uh, but it can be everything from uh, essentially comparing notes on who may be looking in the market, 
Uh, of course, uh, a lot of the companies that we're assisting, be they foreign companies or US companies, they are looking at real estate, uh, uh, industrial sites, uh, vacant office buildings, vacant industrial buildings. So there's a lot of overlap and interaction there. So uh, I think we always welcome the chance to understand what product uh, is out there for us to sell to those clients that we get the chance to talk to first. And of course, our realtor partners are oftentimes very interested in keeping us informed of that. Uh, you never know when the that deal will come in through the door next, and it may be a perfect match uh, between what one of our realtor partners has available. Uh, and then, like I said, the North Carolina Association of Realtors actually does support our nonprofit on an annual basis. And so that gives us more resources to go out there and chase more deals, identify more opportunities looking in North Carolina. Yeah, I think I'll give a little shout out there too for, you know, that question is, work with your global groups at your state and local associations. They're, they're the partner to partner connection um, that our members need to continue that community development, continue those relationships, share that kind of research, the information, you know, real estate association will have that an economic development corporation or group will find valuable to those pitches and those sales um, and drive the partnership at that level through your voice at your state or local association as well. Thanks, Lisa. Um, we'll take one more question, um, and it's back to the F1. And um, the issue used to be not being able to change your status and apply for permanent resident status. Yeah, I, I saw that question, but I, I wasn't sure if there was a question there or what what the question was. Um, right. So maybe, yeah. The, if, if the question is, I I guess the person asking thought that you weren't able to change your status or apply for permanent resident status. Um, and the answer to that is no, it's possible and certainly quite common to change your status, which means going from one non-immigrant visa category to another, usually applying for lawful permanent residence from a student um, status can be extremely challenging, um, but it, it, is, it is possible certainly to change your status and uh, common for those that are here to change their status and, and then get a work visa. Great. So um, in respect of everybody's time, we are four minutes over. Um, in Irish time, we're still on time. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking we're good. Um, but I do want to uh, thank you all. Thanks to our speakers, to our wonderful and amazing NIR staff, and most of all to you for joining us here today. Uh, we've hope, we hope that our speakers have demonstrated the importance of the issue as it pertains to the US real estate market. And just as a reminder, don't forget to go to conference.realtor to sign up for the events. Uh, we've got, as we said, over 100 events for the entire um, annual virtual, um, not New Orleans um, conference. Um, and you'll see the whole, the whole schedule there. We really hope you're gonna join us on, on the rest of our global uh, track as well. And just as a final wrap up, I just want you to know that you can reach out to any of us here, um, in, including Ty, myself, Joe, Charlie, Leo, uh, Lisa and, and, and many more, but but we're here for you. Um, I know things are difficult. They're certainly not going to be easy um, moving forward, but we're going to get through it. But we're here for you and we're here to take your issues. Um, and we're very thankful um, of you for being part of our realtor family. Um, please be well and we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. <laughs>